you are on. Great, thank you. Welcome everyone to this SASE committee meeting. Um, the committee, the meeting will please come to order and will the secretary please call the roll. Director Carr. Present. Director Garcia is running a little bit behind. Director Gokul Gandhi. Present. Director Leonard. Present. And Chair Seamson. Present. We the have we have four present. Mm -hmm. The chair will now ask the secretary to lead us in the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. Members, please mute your devices. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Pursuant to board rule 1.06, this meeting is being conducted virtually. Board members may be participating in person from the Central Services Building. In order to allow as much public, test, public access and participation as possible, this meeting is being broadcast via live stream on the MPS website and on the MPS YouTube stream, the links to which may be found on the MPS website on the broadcast page. Before we begin tonight's meeting, we have a short announcement regarding interpretation services for the Spanish speaking members of our audience. Buenas tardes. Esta junta escolar se transmitirá en español para aquellas personas que lo necesiten. Para escuchar esta junta escolar en español, por favor marque el número 312-626-6799. Repito, para escuchar esta junta en español, por favor marque el 312-626-6799. Y ponga el número de identificación o código que es 608-130-5362. Repito, ponga el número de identificación o código para esta junta que es el 608-130-5362. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much. For each of our items of business, we will hold a discussion and public hearing. Individuals who wished to speak on tonight's items were required to register in advance. I ask those who are waiting to speak to remain on the platform until you are called upon to speak. Just as a reminder, Robert's Rules of Order dictates that all comments should be directed to the chair of the committee. Also, any questions or requests are, are to be directed to the chair who will determine the most efficient way to address them. All speakers are asked to state their name and spell their last name before proceeding with their comments. Each speaker will have two minutes and 15 seconds to speak. After a speaker's time is up, they may continue to follow the meeting at one of the broadcast options mentioned previously. To ensure the good order of the meeting, harassment or intimidation tactics of any kind, including inappropriate language, will not be tolerated. The chair reserves the right to remove anyone engaging in such behavior from the platform. Those removed from the platform may continue to listen to the meeting or access the agenda items online. However, he or she will not be allowed to rejoin the platform. Written testimony may be submitted to the Office of Board Governance, P.O. Box 2181, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53201-2181, or fax to 414-475-8071, or email it to governance at milwaukee.k12.wi.us. Also, for our listening audience, if you wish to access this evening's agenda items and attachments online, you may do so by visiting the Meetings, Agendas, and Minutes page on the MPS website and choosing Online Agendas. Now, let's begin. Madam Secretary, Item 1. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Director Garcia has joined the platform for our listening audience. Um, item number one is action on a request to approve the MPS FY22 Head Start Federal Continuation Grant applica the application. Uh, the recommendation is that the board approve the application submission for the 22-23 school year. Will the administration please present this item? 
Good evening, Jeff Simpson and members of the committee. Keith Posley, Superintendent of Schools. We're requesting your approval to submit the 2022-23 Head Start Federal Grant application. The grant is expected to be just over $11 million. At this time, Joandy Williams is here with us and we can respond between the two of us. We can answer any questions that you may have in regards to this item. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Posley. Um, good evening, Chair Simpson and members of the committee. I am Joanne D. Williams, Manager of Early Childhood Learning. Tonight, we're presenting the Head Start Continuation Grants application for board approval. The grant is a five-year non-competing grant for a Head Start program. Each year, a continuation grant will, is submitted, which will be um, will monitor progress for our program goals. We're in the year four of the four or five, four, the year four or five um, of the grant year. The grant will service our 33 federal Head Start sites with a funded enrollment of 1,506 seats, totaling in $11,316,909. The grant application included the same staff levels as previous grant application. Additionally, we also have the Head Start um, state sites as such as Obama and Kluge. The Head Start coordinators, program supervisor, early child learning manager, director Simpson, and policy council work collaboratively on the creation of the goals, updating the progress of the goals and completion of the application. We'll submit the grant on Monday, February 28th to meet the March 1st deadline. The vision is that all Milwaukee Public School Head Start children will attain high quality school readiness skills and their families will be empowered towards self-sufficiency and taking ownership in their future endeavors. The Head Start program takes a comprehensive approach to working with income eligible families to promote school readiness. The project will help children to develop a keen sense of social competence to help them become independent and confident and learn how to cooperate with others and develop a growing social knowledge and awareness. Ultimately, ultimately the Head Start's goal is for children to be ready for school and prepared for life experiences in order to be productive citizens in the community. We are happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you so much. Do committee members wish to make comments or ask questions at this time? Director Gokul Gandhi. I just want to say the proficiency rates um, that you have listed here for the objectives for uh, K4 and K5, K3 and K4 students um, look promising, um, if I'm reading it correctly. And I just would love for you to comment on what trends you've been seeing, even in the midst of uh, an ongoing pandemic. Ms. Williams. Uh, Chair Simpson and um, Director Boko Gandhi, um, I'm seeing that a lot of students, um, they already come in high performing um, in a lot of our areas. Um, we work towards a social emotional aspect and making sure that they're exceeding or on target and then exceeding where they should be. Um, but by the time that they do leave us um, in, in, this, in these grades, they're um, very well on to be ready for K-5. Um, K Thank you, Director Gokogandi. Any follow-up? All right, any other board members have a question or comment they'd like to make? Oh, Director Leonard. Just that, uh, just a testimonial. So my, my grandson was in the Head Start and, and he started at a young age. There is clearly a significant advantage uh, to being in the program. So keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you for that, Director Leonard. Um, Madam Secretary, do we have any public comment on this item? Madam Chair, we have no request for public testimony on this item. Thank you. Um, I would like to pass the gavel just for a moment to Director Garcia. So noted. Got the gavel. <laughs> Thank you, Director Garcia. Um, I was just, you know, I just wanted to say that um, the work of the Head Start program is as I think I often say at these meetings, it was just so important, critical to our community and the, the work and dedication that goes into this program it, that you see evidence of tonight with this grant is just a testament to the, the individuals who work in that program every day to look out for the health and well-being and the educational um, guidance that they need for the for the for our youngest learners in our community. So I just want to thank um, Joandy Williams and the whole department for the work they do for Head Start. And with that, I'll take the gavel back. So noted. Thank you. Um, 
what I do, what is the pleasure of this committee with respect to, oh, Director Gokulkandi, I'm sorry, did you have a question or was this a motion? Wonderful, go ahead. Um, I move to approve the request to, for the MPS FY22 Head Start Federal Continuation Grant application. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, will the secretary please call the roll? On Director Gokul Gandhi's motion to approve submission of the FY22 Head Start Federal uh, Continuation Grant application. Director Carr? Aye. Director Garcia? Aye. Director Gokul Gandhi? Aye. Director Leonard? Aye. And Chair Seamson? Aye. That's five ayes. The motion passes. Thank you. Madam Secretary, next item, please. The next item is item number two, which is a report with possible action regarding the MPS MKE Early Childhood 1825 Initiative. This is an informational item, and although it has been noticed for possible action, no action is required. Will administration please present this item? Chair Simpson and members of the committee, our MPS MKE Early Childhood Initiative presentation this evening will include uh, the initiative focus and goals completed in current and future work, as well as next steps. This evening, Joanne De Williams is here to present the MPS MKE Early Childhood 1825 Initiative. Following her presentation, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Joanne Thank you, Dr. Polsey. Good evening, Chair Simpson and members of the board. Um, my name is John D. Williams, and I'm the Early Child Learning Manager for Milwaukee Public Schools. Tonight, I'm also joined by Terrell Wheelock, um, 4C's Project Coordinator and Pathways Quality, Quality Lead, who will be providing uh, partner updates later during our presentation. This evening, I will share with you an update of the work that has been ongoing for the MPS MKE Early Childhood 1825 Initiative. The MPS MKE Early Childhood 1825 Initiative supports the district priorities for, uh, for success by focusing on the work to increase academic achievement, by targeting school readiness, improve, culture, improve school culture with young learners, um, secure in social and emotional development, develop staff on high quality practices, and strengthen communication and collaboration with the community throughout partnerships that aim to connect all within the city of Milwaukee. This slide demonstrates the demographic data reflective of the early childhood population being served in 111 of Milwaukee Public Schools for the 21-22 school year. The demographics are as follows for our listening audience. We have 11,108 students in grades K-3 through K-5, which are three-year-olds through, two, through um, five-year-olds. 6.1% are English language learners, 18.2% um, students with disabilities, and 74.7% economically disadvantaged. The mission of this collaborative initiative is to improve the learning experiences for children ages birth through five years old in the city of Milwaukee. The overarching goal is to ensure that all stakeholders who have a role in early care and education have the understanding, the skill set, capacity, and resources needed to provide high quality instruction and support to all children and families participating in early childhood education programs. Thus, the five elements for high quality early childhood education and programming serve as the priorities and focus for the overall implementation of the MPS MKE 1825 initiative. This partnership group works on collaboratively supporting the community by providing early childhood staff development, supporting family engagement and school transition, training on high quality and impactful instruction, focusing on social and emotional learning, and assisting with equitable resources within every learning setting. During the period between November, um, November 2021 to January 2022, the MPS MKE 1825 initiative completed tasks that addressed the work of the initiative in, multi in a multitude of ways. For example, um, we had professional development that, has uh, that was taken by to all, um, given to all um, educators in the area, such as zones of regulation, curriculum trainings, and communities of practice. We had 60 educators participate. Coping with stress for parent coordinators, approximately 100 parent coordinators. Um, integrating SEL and academics PD at SST institutes and teacher institutes. 103 educators are part of this um, training as well. As it relates to equitable resources, the Bridges to School Milwaukee is a community-based partnership that aims to connect families, childcare providers, 
and schools in Milwaukee to increase the number of children attending, thriving, and succeeding in Milwaukee um, schools. It will do so by collaborating with the school administration, community school um, coordinator, and parent coordinator to develop events and activities that help connect families, childcare providers, and the school community. Additionally, the Bridges of School um, project aims to engage K-4, K-5 teachers to understand what is going well in terms of their current connections to early child education and what kinds of things they would like to see develop further to bridge the early child, childhood education to kindergarten gap. The Bridges of School project has a coordinator that was hired in December of 2022 who will work collaboratively with community school staff as well as other community-based partners to build bridges and develop shared plans, activities, and events that help support families with children ages zero to five. Um, in an effort to um, provide ongoing education, we um, develop skills and resources to pr um, promote um, and moving pr promote in a new educational direction. The community was provided with family engagement resources and community information. This effort aims to improve outcomes for both families and MPS um, and the Milwaukee community by sharing services and activities with the, the parent coordinators and via the MPS Early Childhood website. Additionally, the Head Start program provided over 1,200 health kits to currently enrolled students and an additional supply for the classroom teachers as they may receive additional students in the second half of the school year. The kit included hygiene, um, it included a, hy a hygiene kit, safety on the go kit, a hand sanitizer, healthy helpings, my plate game, um, kick, uh, kickball, comet ball, bubbles, and my best self activity journal and a tote bag. As it relates to instruction, MPS representation at the Pathways to Quality Conference allowed for an opportunity to share information about current practices and topics in early learning with childcare providers living and working in the greater Milwaukee area. A session entitled, Let's Talk, led by our very own Ms. Chrissy Washington. The session focused on supporting meaningful conversations among young children and how it can be challenging, but it's well worth the effort. Since many studies have shown that conversation skills are important for children's development and well-being, there's definitely a need to develop and support speaking and listening skills in early childhood. So let's talk about it. By focusing on rich conversations and the ways to provide them, we can be sure that children's voice and, th and their thinking will be heard. This session has 16 participants that attended virtually. Additionally, the cycle one uh, for ambitious instruction plan focused on intentional planning for learning. To support the district-wide effort, early child instructional design information was highlighted with the Ambitious Instruction Accelerated Learning eBook that will be shared later tonight by our Senior Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Dr. Felicia Saffold. As it relates to the social and emotional learning and cultural linguistic needs, the initiative continues to support Children's of Wisconsin Positive Parenting Program, Triple P, um, which teaches families um, with children of zero to 12 years about behavior management and building relationships. The event sessions began September 7th and concluded November 16th. We will continue to look for more opportunities for our families from Children's Hospital of Wisconsin and share with the district and the community at large. The MPS MK Early Child Initiative will continue to work of, on the initiative goals in the following ways. As part of the MPS MK Early Child 1825, we will support the oral language development an ongoing speaker series known as a Soli series, supporting oral language in the early years. This is being provided to the Milwaukee community. Research has shown that children's language comprehension increases when daily interactions between an adult and a child have meaning and are intentional and purposeful. The first session was held on February 8th, in which we had 39 stakeholders attend that included district leaders, teachers, child care partners, and caregivers. The Fred Rogers Center team will continue to facilitate this series of learning sessions for educators where they will introduce um, um, to educators and those who support them to a theoretical and practical framework, simple interactions framework, and how to identify and understand daily interactions with children as the active ingredients of learning and development. These sessions will continue building background information on improving language by encouraging simple but deep conversations between a child and adult, either parent or educator. As part of phase one of our pilot of Bridges to School Milwaukee continues, partners will continue to work together to build relationships and make connections across systems and networks that support early learning. As such, the selection of the three participating community schools will be made in addition to the hiring of the Bridges to School Coordinator, which was already um, concluded in December. MPS will continue to support the Bridges to School Coordinator in, in making direct connections with MPS supports. Tonight, I have Ms. Terrell Wheelock, project lead at 4C, 
who will share some additional partner information as it pertains to Bridges to School Milwaukee project. 4C for Children provides training for existing and new child care providers, helps parents navigate through the myriad of child care options available, and works closely with the state of Wisconsin, Young Start, and is recognized as a leader in the field of early education. Ms. Tara Willock, please join us. Thank you. So current activity with the Bridges to School work is the three schools have been selected, three community schools have been selected. They are Browning, Longfellow, and Westside. Um, and work will begin with those programs within this school year. The community schools will be the hub for bridging activities within the community. The regulated childcare programs within a half mile radius of the schools have been identified for outreach and further um, participation. Thank you. As it relates to family support and transition, early childhood focus to provide an overview of district offerings as well as focus on strategy support oral language development at the Celebrating Ability session on March 2nd. Stay tuned for additional information on our uh, district portal for that event. MPS will also participate in the Mind in the Making training, which will, Mind in the Making is, um, has seven essential life skills that help adults understand and encourage important executive functions based skills um, children need to thrive. The plan is to offer the sessions to families and educators in collaboration with the Office of Family and Community Engagement. As it pertains to professional development, we'll continue to offer professional development that is not only applicable to schools, but to the community as well, with a focus on equity, ambitious instruction, and developmentally appropriate practices. Young learners will be assured that differentiated goals and accelerated experiences are suited to their learning and develop development and are challenging enough to promote their progress and interest. We're also continuing to support the soft rollout and training of our early learning screener for GANS. The screener will assist teachers in verifying what students know and support them as they plan for learning opportunities aligned to student need. Also, the work will continue on the goal of ensuring high quality by providing specific early learning PD that accelerates student learning. This training includes the following sessions. Session one, which was using the early childhood screens three for developmental screening with approximately 500 participants to date that took, place, that took part in that. Session two is using the Screens 3 online management system, OMS, which to date we have 390 participants that took, place, that took part, of that, part of that as well. Upcoming, you will see that we have a third session um, entitled Using the Inventory of Early Childhood Development, IED 3, which, be, which will be forthcoming and ongoing now. The important work must continue in order to have an impact on young learners to ultimately ensure um, Im improve school readiness. Thus, the MPS MK EC 1825 Vision Initiative plans to work on the following. The community will continue to benefit from the ongoing Soli series sessions that will be offered throughout the spring that will take place on March 22nd and May 18th from 5 to 6.30. We look forward to seeing all stakeholders, including district leaders, teachers, parents, caregivers, and staff there. Please visit Milwaukee, our Milwaukee uh, website and um, come to the EC Initiative um, page to uh, obtain more information. We will continue to support the soft rollout and training of the early learning screener, as mentioned earlier, Brigands, and um, we'll continue to support the ambitious instruction learning plan um, providing district supports. We'll also complete the rollout of our Ready 4K, an evidence-based family engagement curriculum de delivered via text message will be underway. Each week with this Ready 4K, parents and caregivers will receive fun facts and easy tips on how to promote their children's development by building on existing family routines. As such, community resource information will continue to be shared so MPS families will be able to take advantage of the community um, learning opportunities that may not have, they, they may have not been aware of. We will continue to collaborate with partners on the work of Bridges to School Project and support the coordinator as they begin outreach and subsequent activities and events to families um, and early education providers within the three geographic areas surrounding the three participating community schools. I'll turn it over again to Ms. Wheelock, who will, um, from Project Lead from Four Cs, who will share some additional information of our future work as well. Thank you. Um, so our work um, will be to continue to build and strengthen the bridges and the collaborations that we are building with the existing partners including community schools, United Way, the Office of Early Childhood Initiatives, and 4C for Children, and then to continue to develop the common language messaging and activities to connect childcare programs to the community schools, 
in outreach that engages parents and families in supporting the growth and development of children. The MPS NKE Early Child 1825 Initiative continues to gain positive traction and works to refine the blueprint in our community for our youngest learners, whom are our future leaders. At this time, I'll be happy to address any questions that you may have. Thank you so much for that report. So much important um, work happening there. And um, thank you, Ms. Wheelock, for joining us this evening. Do committee members wish to make comments or ask questions at this time? Seeing none, uh, Madam Secretary, do we have any public comment on this item? Madam Chair, we have no request for public testimony on this item. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All right, well, as this was an informational item, um, thank you again to Ms. Wheelock and to uh, Ms. Joandy Williams for um, participating and sharing with us the great work that's going on. Madam Secretary, next item, please. Madam Chair, for our listening audience, uh, Director Peterson has joined the committee. Um, item number three is a report with possible action regarding the Black Lives Matter Week campaign and planning for the 21-22 school year. This is an informational item, and although it has been noticed for possible action, no action is required. Will administration please present this item? Chair Simpson and members of the committee, uh, we are pleased to bring forward our bi-monthly report on planning efforts related to the Black Lives Matter Week campaign. I would like to thank the many individuals that participated in the planning events and working with community uh, with committees uh, committees to develop uh, and and carry out this important work. The hard work of these uh, individuals resulted in meaningful and engaging district wide events during Black Lives Matter Week. I would further like to thank those that participated in the uh, programming uh, school based events that contributed to students engaging in Black Lives Matter Week campaign as well. At this time, I would like to uh, thank two individuals who have led this work on behalf of the district, Felice Bill and Dr. Tony Dinkins. And uh, Ms. Bill will begin the presentation at this time, after which we will be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Ms. Bill. Good evening, Director Simpson and members of the committee. My name is Felice Bill, Instructional Leadership Director for Central Region. I am happy to report that the Black Lives Matter initiative continues to develop and move forward towards the resolution goals and expectations. Today's presentation will provide you with the 2021-22 school year updates on the activities of Black Lives Matter. Today, we have also included in this presentation, Ms. Nantiana Buck, who is the co-chair for the curriculum committee. The development of Black Lives Matter initiative is cr a critical component aligned to the five priorities of success. This school year, we have strengthened communication and collaboration by collaborating with the Office of Supervision and Administration, Office of Academics, Curriculum and Instruction, Office of Communications and School Performance, school leaders, school support teachers, community partners, community constituents, partners, and community schools. We have worked to connect with members of the core committees for this year's Black Lives Matter initiative. Our committees continue to evolve and increase as requests are received for participation. Our core committees continue to work diligently towards achieving the goals for this school year and add impact to this work. And now we will have Ms. Nanciata Bob. Chair Simpson and members of the committee, my name is Nanciata Portis Buck, District Literacy Curriculum Specialist, Office of Academics. The curriculum committee has developed a racial equity readiness questionnaire scheduled to pilot February 28th, 2022, with the Office of Academics. We've developed a proposal to support direct training on how to utilize the questionnaire, provide feedback, and have additional resources provided for and by teachers. We focus this year's professional learning for principals, APs, special education supervisors, and dean's work on Dr. Goldie Muhammad's framework on culturally responsive teaching. As a result of our collaboration with the Department of Public Instruction, Dr. Goldie Muhammad has facilitated monthly curric 
culturally and historically responsive education leadership sessions through the Engaged Educator Cohort. And we have an enhanced professional learning opportunities for the Office of Academics, the Black and Latino Male Achievement, and the Bilingual Multicultural Education Leaders and Coaches. We were blessed to partner with several community organizations to ensure that we promoted self-awareness and empowerment, highlighting the talents of our students. We established monthly activities and partnered with the monthly school BLM Projects Committee to modify and enhance future projects. We've developed three culturally responsive teaching modules on the learning management system. And since 2017, this administration has worked with the board to implement district-wide equity training in the form of Courageous Conversations about race. And we've worked closely with the Courageous Conversations about race vendor and are currently expanding the capacity of trainers who will be trained by the vendor to support the expansion of this work for our district. Chair Simpson and members of the board, Felice Bill, Instructional Leadership Director for Central Region. I want to point to the picture that was on our last slide. That picture there that you see was one of the creations of our very own MPS student, Pardoso Iman from Story School, who won the, uh, comp the competition for the t-shirt logo for this year's Black Lives Matter. So we were proud to showcase that on our website as well as you saw this behind many of the speakers for the Week of Action. This year's Week of Action was informative and interactive. We increased the number of student participants to gain input and the opinion of our youth, young adults, and generations of all ages. Monday, Dr. Dakota Irby led an interactive session where he discussed the complex process of racial equity reform within the K-12 schools. Dr. Irby discussed how to grow equity capacity in organizations at every level. Irby offered a useful framework for racial equity improvement and answered participant questions related to the content of his presentation. On day two, we had the Black Film Festival conversation, which was an interactive discussion of educators and participants. Teachers were provided a movie to watch per grade band that was asked to watch during the school day with students. A group conversation was held during the week of action that addressed the movie content, message, and its relation to the principles of Black Lives Matter. In particular, restorative justice, loving engagement, and collective value. Day three, the intergenerational panel discussion was a collective conversation among youth and adults of all generations. Topics surrounded a few of the demands of Black Lives Matter and several principles. Youth provided their thoughts and understanding with knowledge of the adults to further uh, be active in the plight for change. People logged in in various states, professors held classes, and joined in on this night. Day four, HBCU and Divine Nine discussion was informative and inclusive. It aligned to the principles of Black villages, Black families, Black women, and collective value. Historical information was shared about the development of historical Black colleges and universities, along with the history of Black fraternity and sororities, and their commitment to diversity, inclusion, and community service. Questions were asked of the panel and plans to support equity and community service to lessen the challenges we face in Milwaukee City and schools. Day five was the last night of the week of action. This was the staff and student showcase. Uh, where student talents were highlighted with many presentations about restorative justice, collective value, and the demand for equity and change. Our students and staff truly shine. Chair Seamson and members of the committee, my name is Dr. Tony Dinkins, Regional Superintendent for the East Region. The monthly school BLM Projects Committee continued to blossom. In November, we focused on activities around justice for George and restorative justice. In December, we highlighted Black activists with disabilities, which aligns with our principles of globalism and collective value. In January, we focused on Black rad radical educators, which aligns to Black villages. During this month of February, we seek to expand student understanding of these principles and the four demands connected through the week of action and the monthly activities. 
to align with the principles of loving engagement and empathy. In March, we will focus on student activism. In April, it will be Black Radical Educators. We are proud of the work of the Black, uh, of the monthly school uh, projects committee and the work that the teachers have provided as, long with, as well as the engagement of students. The Black Lives Matter Committee has continued to engage community partners. This year, we have worked with Milwaukee Community Schools, the Black and Latino Male Achievement Office, Milwaukee Teachers Education Association, and the Milwaukee Metropolitan Association for Black School Educators. We will continue to expand on our community engagement and collaboration. And we would like to thank all of our community partners for their participation and support throughout this school year. Next steps will be to establish professional development for sensitive topics, embracing all families, CRT, the uh, restorative justice to provide sensitive training for all stakeholders. We want to make sure that we provide exemplars in highlighting Black Lives Matter through videos of conversations and highlighting instructional practices between staff and students. We want to make sure that we share fam with families uh, to explain Black Lives Matter and to inform students what they will engage in during the lessons and activities, connecting them to their community throughout the year. Development of effective systems for schools to share completed activities, we want to establish a system to house and highlight schools that provide information that can be shared with all schools and create ideas for MPS Black Lives Matter Student Showcase 2023. This concludes our presentation of the goals outlined for this year and where we are thus far. We're now prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for that informative uh, report about the important work that's happening in our school district this year. It's wonderful to see. Do committee members wish to make any comments or ask questions at this time? Seeing none. Um, Madam Secretary, do we have any public comments on this item? Madam Chair, we have no request for public testimony on this item. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All right, well, this was an informational item. So um, thank you again for that report. And Madam Secretary, next item, please. The next item is item number four, which, which is a report with possible action regarding the 53206 initiative. This is an informational item, and although it has been noticed for possible action, no action is required. Will the administration please present this item? Chair Simpson and members of the committee, this evening, we are prepared to share an update with the work associated with the 53206 initiative. At this time, I'll ask Mr. Maurice Turner to begin the presentation, and afterwards, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Mr. Turner. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Simpson and members of the Student Achievement School Innovation Committee. I am Maurice Turner, Instructional Leadership Director for the High School Region. It is our pleasure to provide the committee with an update on the work in the Promise Partnership Schools. This evening, I am joined by Dr. Coletta Nolan, Regional Superintendent for the Central Region, and Ms. Janelle Hawkins, Senior Director of the Citywide Region. Since our last update in October, we added a coordinator to our team. The coordinator joined the team in late November and he has hit the ground running and has been very busy lifting the strategic plan work around engaging the community and business partners on behalf of Promise Partnership Schools. We look forward to bringing him and the work that he's involved in before the SASE committee soon. We thank you for approving this addition to our team. Next slide. The initiative lines up with the district's five priorities for success, increasing academic achievement, improving district and school culture, develop of staff, ensuring fiscal responsibility and transparency, and strengthening communication and collaboration. Slide three. Here are the demographics for the 53206 Promise Partnership Schools. Currently, we have 1,975 students enrolled in the eight schools. 0.2% of our students are classified 
as English language learners. 25.5% of our students receive specialized services. And lastly, 88.2% of our students are economically disadvantaged. Next slide, please. Here are the current vacancies in 53206 Promise Partnership Schools. We have eight teachers. This includes one vacancy for Spanish teacher, eight paraprofessionals, one children's health assistant, 2.4 physical education teachers, 0.7 music teacher, 0.5 art teacher, and a 0.4 counselor. Addressing teacher vacancies in Promise Partnership Schools still remains a high priority. The 53206 Promise Partnership Strategic Plan outlines multiple strategies in Pillar 2 to retain, recruit, and attract teachers to our schools and classrooms. The Senior Director of Talent Management is a vital member of our leadership team and has drafted several proposals for retention, recruitment, and attraction. Some of these plans need the approval of the board. But here are the plans. Recruitment plan for 53206 schools. The recruitment plan is designed to attract licensed educators to fill the following teaching positions. Those positions are as follows. Mathematics, science, art, music, physical education, special education, which would include comprehensive behavioral, and academic units in autism, and lastly, world language teacher positions. Interested and licensed candidates will receive a staffing incentive of $10,000 for mathematics, science, and special education positions in 53206 schools. Individuals interested in serving in 53206 schools in the areas of art, music, and physical education and world language will receive a $5,000 uh, incentive. Candidates shall remain employed and assigned to 53206 schools within NPS for a minimum of 36 months. Retention plan. Employees, this is another plan that would need to be approved by the board. Employee staff in these schools would be eligible for a one-time $250 stipend uh, retention incentive for each year served in 53206 schools. <clears throat> Here are some of the retention strategies that have gone forward already within our pillar. On November 1st through the 5th, leaders recognized every staff member in their building with an appreciation card. We know, we all know that something as simple as recognizing a staff member for coming to work every day and putting their best foot forward for children goes a long way. All leaders participated in making this personal connection. November 8th through the 19th, Promise Partnership Schools distributed a staff stay survey to all staff members. We received over 200 responses to the survey. The responses gave us insights into our staff's commitment levels to our schools, as well as provided us with recommendations on improving them. Here are a few themes that came from staff in regards to responses to a, a, a single question. The single question was, if staff had an opportunity to change one big thing, what would it be? Here are some of the responses we received. One, staff would like to see better engagement with community and family engagement. Staff also noted that they wanted to see a intentional focus on building relationships across our buildings. And lastly, they wanted to ensure that resources and materials were available for students. Other retention activities included on November 15th through the 19th, which was uh, staff American Education Week. Leaders were provided with a week's worth of activities to engage their staffs in. Some examples of these activities were have a Coke and a smile for one day, 
as well as hosting staff luncheons for staff in their buildings. Here are recruitment events uh, that are included in the recruitment plan. Our state recruitment efforts include recruitment teams, excuse me, forgive me, out of state recruitment efforts include recruitment teams hosting fairs at historically black colleges and universities. Milwaukee Public Schools will be at the Tennessee State University's Jump Start Your Career Fair on Friday, February 25th, 2022. MPS will then move on to attending the Career Fair at Arkansas Pine Bluff on Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022. On Thursday, March 31st, 2022, MPS will be at the Jackson State University Teacher Recruitment Day. MPS Talent Management is confirming dates for two other historically Black colleges. Those colleges are Rust College and Tuskegee. St here are staff recruitment efforts at the local level. On February 19, 2022, MPS will be at the Sherman Phoenix at the Blackout. That's next Saturday. MPS will then host its own recruitment fair at Milwaukee Marshall, February 26, 2022, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. We are also scheduling a Our Lights Are On for school-based recruitment events tentatively in the month of April, 2022. At this, uh, next slide, please. Report card scores became available shortly after our update in October of 2021. We thought that it was important to share the report card scores with the committee. Priority weights that went into the rating for our schools were based on two areas for the 2020-2021 school year. Those areas were academic achievement, in English language arts and mathematics. On, the other area was on track to graduation. On track to graduation would be defined as how successfully students are achieving educational mind, milestones that predict later success. The predictors of later success in students include chronic absenteeism, school-wide attendance, third grade ELA, and mathematics. The Department of Public Instruction recognizes the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on student learning and advises the use of caution when interpreting of school scores and ratings. As you can see on the slide, one of our schools fell into alternate, alternate rating, that would be Andrew S. Douglas, Two schools fell into the area of meeting expectations. Two schools fell into meeting few expectations. And lastly, three schools fell into fails to meet expectations. Next slide, please. We also have fall star results that we wanted to, shoot, to share with you. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Director Hall. Good evening, Chair Simpson and members of the board. My name is Janelle Hawkins. I serve as the Senior Director of the Citywide Region. This slide is a snapshot into 53206 academic school year. We heard your request in regards to sharing some data, and we wanted to be able to provide you with that snapshot tonight. A few things to keep in mind as we review this data this evening is we're looking at the fall star data. STAR is our district assessment used in grades kindergarten through high school. It is a computer adaptive test used to screen students three times per school year in the areas of early literacy, reading, and math. It is also used to progress monitor students who receive academic interventions, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Early literacy, is administered, excuse me, administered to our first and second grade students. Reading is administered to our second through 10th grade students. And math is administered to our first through 10th grade students. 
Now, as you are looking at this slide, I want you to keep in mind that it is not uncommon for many of our schools to score slightly higher in the fall in, in the red on this assessment. Our goal is for each child to make growth. That is why school leaders and teacher teams are busy every single day disaggregating data to ensure each child has a plan for improvement. Typically, as we work with school leaders, the charge is for each individual child to have a plan. Our schools are using such plans as a plan do study act so that we are continually monitoring how students are doing on a daily basis. Although it's not included in this PowerPoint today, I would like you to know that as this is the fall STAR assessment, we have started to see an uptick in our winter results. Our winter results have not been included because they were still coming in, but I just wanna give you a glimpse of what's happening with our winter STAR assessment. In early literacy, 6.1 fewer students are in the red and 24 students improved a performance category. In reading, 90 students improved a performance category. And in math, 121 students improved a performance category. We know this is not nearly enough and we are really looking forward to those spring results as we're taking our time to monitor what is happening with each individual child. We know that interventions play a major part. We can never take the place of teacher instruction. However, many of our students need additional supports, which is why we spend time with interventions. Keep in mind, when we talk about interventions in our district, we're not just talking about computer interventions. We're also talking about teacher-led instruction, teacher interventions, I'm sorry, that should be happening every day in classrooms. 53206, have been, 53206 schools have been proactive in ensuring that interventions are happening every day in literacy and in math. As an extension of the regular curriculum, intervention supports are provided and teachers work with our scholars to ensure specific skills are met. For example, one of the intervention programs we use is iReady. This program specifically targets those learning gaps where children are struggling. Teachers get computerized programs back to say these are the areas and these are the ways in which I can move this particular student. Teachers are able to plan for instruction, set goals with students, and assess learner progress frequently. What you see on the screen is a list of interventions as well as resources that schools within 53206 are using to move more students toward proficiency. Schools in 53206 have also developed tutoring plans that outline additional supports and efforts to ensure greater proficiency for all of our students. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Carletta Nolan, who will walk through our Spotlight School for this evening. Good evening, Chair Stinson and members of the committee. I am Dr. Carletta Nolan, Regional Superintendent for the Central Region. I am sitting in tonight for Mr. Tony Mitchell, the proud principal of Gwen T. Jackson, home of the Tigers. Gwen T. Jackson is one of the schools within the 53206 portfolio of schools. Um, this school serves to educate 271 students spanning from grades K-3 through grade 5. The school community is, is extremely proud of their STEAM center, which helps to encourage hands-on, minds-on learning. In the STEAM Center, students are exposed to the academic content for science, engineering, art, and mathematics. All instruction and tasks are aligned with the Wisconsin State Standards and the MPS Mathematics and Science Curriculum. <clears throat> the goals of STEAM at Jackson are to enhance student creativity, heighten students' ability to problem solve, build on students' background knowledge of various scientific concepts, Practice brainstorming, planning, creating, and improving communication. Develop and enhance team building and collaboration among students. Develop students' ability to be critical thinkers and successful scientists. And to develop students' love for science, engineering, arts, and mathematics. These goals are wrapped around the Jackson 5 Cs. These five Cs are creativity, critical thinking, communication, 
compassion, and congratulates. Through the five C's, students are encouraged to express their creativity by thinking outside of the box. The use of open-ended questions and complex tasks promote students to think at higher levels. Students are encouraged to collaborate, brainstorm, plan, and communicate with each other as they work through their complex tasks as they compute, use academic language that demonstrates their understanding of science and mathematical concepts to create their designs. As stated earlier, the STEAM-based activities and tasks are aligned to the Wisconsin State Standards and the MPS Science Curriculum. The activities progress from simple explorations of related STEM ideas and engineering design processes and project lead the way and culminating in open-ended design tasks. The open-ended nature of these design tasks allows students with varying academic abilities to succeed, meeting the needs of a broad range of students. There are two theory rooms within the STEM Center at Jackson one for K-3 to K-5 students, and one for first through fifth grade. The theory rooms differ in that the materials, furniture, and tasks are developmentally and age appropriate. The K-3 room is outfitted and right-sized to support tiny hands and little bodies. The activities in both rooms may include reading stories and design trials to demonstrate how STEM, literacy, cultural understanding, and creativity are needed to solve a problem. For instance, students in grades K3 through five were read the story of the three little pigs and were challenged to use non-traditional and recyclable materials to replicate the houses as they described as they were described in the story. Second graders read the text "The Three Billy Goat Gruff" and used binder clips, popsicle sticks, paper tubing and other materials to design bridges that could hold sets of books. Learning in this broader context piques students' interest, captures their imagination, and helps them to understand how classroom learning interacts with the real world or can be used to solve real world problems. Most activities in the STEAM Center take place in small groups to encourage students to consider more than one solution or idea. The team concept creates a foundation for students to work together to, to develop and design to develop a design and learn from their peers and teachers. Working in small groups also provides the opportunity for students to refine communication skills. Students are encouraged to communicate what they are doing and why to promote deep thinking and reflection. It also provides opportunities for students to share their ideas through several modalities, oral, written, drawn, and construction. Currently in the makerspace, grade five students are designing a miniature golf course. To the surprise of the staff, only four of the 36 fifth graders had knowledge of what a miniature golf course was. Therefore, Background knowledge had to be built in order for them to complete the task. Students conducted research, watched videos, and took virtual trips to miniature golf courses, after which they engaged in the collaborative design process, brainstorming and planning their designs. Students had to use their creativity and critical thinking to design, select materials, and build obstructions to make the courses harder and to figure out how to keep the ball inside the hole. Consideration is given to having students take a field trip to a real miniature golf course. And once the projects are completed, students will host a miniature golf tournament where students from all grade levels will have an opportunity to try their putting skills on the student-made courses. Gwen T. Jackson Elementary School's STEM Center is an example of pillar one in action as it speaks to the objectives of academic achievement and aligned and integrated pathways. As we continue to strengthen project-based learning in each of the 53206 partnership schools, formal training on project-based learning, project lead the way and cross-curricular instruction will be provided during late spring and early summer. 
Implementation will begin in the fall of 2022-2023 school year. With this training, we can expect to see a shift in the traditional style of teaching to a flexible classroom style where teachers become facilitators of learning. In addition, we are exploring and seeking to engage in professional development through partnerships between MPS, technical colleges, universities, and local businesses that support the inclusion of all STEAM areas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nolan. And at this time, this ends our presentation and we will take any questions that the committee has. Thank you so much for that uh, report with some great detail in it. Um, do committee members wish to make comments or ask questions? Director Leonard. Um, I actually have a couple of questions, some for just clarity for myself. Um, so the first one has to do with the vacancies. Are the vacancies due to budget cuts or excessing, or is it just that we could not get the people we needed in there? Administration. Sure. Is it on? Mm -hmm. Director Leonard and members of the committee, Maurice Turner, Instructional Leadership Director for the high school region. Uh, many of the vacancies are a result of us not being able to find staff to fill those positions. So it's not due to accessing or those types of activities, it's due to just not being able to find individuals to fill those positions. Chair Simpson and members of the committee, uh, members of the committee uh, also know that that's all of the schools in 53206. That's not just one school, that's all schools combined. Yeah, I, I understood. I understood that. I just so I, I'm glad I know that. Um, I like your recruiting efforts. I, I like that you're going out and actually hunting for teachers. That's probably what we're all going to have to do. Um, I also am just curious of if you might, if you don't know, you can get back to me on it. What is your classroom size to teacher ratio in the five three two in those eight schools? Administration. Um. Good. Chair Simpson, um, Director Leonard, members of the committee, um, in the elementary schools within the 53206, the class size um, varies, especially in the lower grades between, um, I would say average class size is probably um, 18 to 21 in the lower grades, and then upwards of maybe 28 to 32 in some of the intermediate or middle grades. Um, in the middle schools, I think those classrooms vary at least 30 in the middle schools. And then of course we have North Division um, High School and those um, I would have to get back to you unless of course you I know can, that. I can speak to sure. that. Maurice Turner, Instructional Leadership Director for the High School Region. Um, class sizes in North Division are very, very manageable. I would say between eight to 21 is kind of the average size. I mean, 18 to 21, forgive me. 18 to 21 is the average size at North Division High School. All right. That's good to know. I'm sorry. No, oh, go right ahead. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, and then just, I, I also want to uh, mirror what uh, uh, Director Simpson said. I, I love the detailed uh, uh, information you gave on the STEAM uh, activities. It makes me miss teaching. It really does. I, I enjoyed doing a lot of engaging, hands-on work with students. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for the answers. Thank you, Director Leonard. Um, as uh, do any other committee members, I see Director Gokul Gandhi. Um, I would love if we could get an invite to the golfing, mini golfing situation. It would be fun to see what the kids came up with. I'm not promising I'm good at golf, but I think uh, it would just be fun to, to see what the kids came up with. I agree. <laughs> I'm sure that can be arranged. <laughs> Any Chair further? Simpson, yeah, go ahead. Chair Simpson and members of the committee, we will be more than happy to get invites out to the board in regards to this. Thank you. Sounds fun. Director Gokogani, anything else? No? Um, do any other committee members have comments or questions? Okay. Um, Madam Secretary, do we have any public comment on this item? 
Madam Chair, we have no request for public testimony on this item. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All right, well, this was an informational item. So thank you so much for that presentation again. And Madam Secretary, next item, please. The next item is item number five, which is a report with possible action on the NPS Montessori strategic plan. This is an informational item and although it has been noticed for possible action, no action is required. Will administration please present this item? Chair Simpson and members of the committee, we are prepared to share the 2021-22 quarterly report regarding the Montessori strategic plan. At this time, I will ask that Abigail Routh, our Montessori coordinator, begin the presentation, and after which we will be more than happy to entertain any questions you may have, we may have, you may have. However, we have Joe DiCarlo here with us as well, proud principal of uh, Maryland Montessori School. Abigail. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Simpson, members of the board. My name is Abigail Rausch and I am the Montessori coordinator. I'm here this evening with Joe DiCarlo, principal of Maryland Avenue Montessori School to provide the quarterly update on the Montessori strategic plan. We want to begin this presentation by sharing how the Montessori strategic plan embodies the district's five priorities for success, especially increase academic achievement and accountability, develop our staff and strengthen communication and collaboration. The ambitious instruction plan, Accelerating Learning, is the instructional framework for all schools and classrooms in MPS. We fulfill this expectation through utilizing the Montessori method, which is based on the philosophy that children reach their fullest potential through multi-age interactions in an inquisitive, cooperative, and encouraging atmosphere through self-directed activity and hands-on learning using unique materials. In addition, the 10 elements outlined in the district's academic standard of care are embedded in the Montessori philosophy. Tonight, we wanted to update the board on the progress of the Montessori strategic plan. The Montessori Advisory Committee has continued to hold meetings for the school year for the months of November, January, and February. In December, we continue to work on items outlined in the November meeting. Meetings are held um, one Monday a month from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Everyone is welcome at all meetings. We completed developing the Montessori Material Standard of Care, which was a year long project. This is an inventory of all the items that should be included in an MPS Montessori classroom. Material standards of care were created for each grade band, primary, lower elementary, and upper elementary. This work included gathering samples from the different Montessori organizations, working with school administrators, school support teachers, and gathering valuable feedback from teaching staff. The inventories are approved and are use currently in the district. We have conducted a baseline inventory in every classroom and are using that data to intentionally purchase items using our textbook adoption monies. Future use of the inventory will ensure fidelity of Montessori programs as well as equity across the district. Our annual teacher retention survey has been completed. We use this data to anticipate any openings that may occur for next year. As Montessori teacher hiring timelines around the country and the world are much earlier than that of MPS, it is important to have advance notice of any openings we may anticipate. This helps with planning of teacher recruitment strategies. At this time, we anticipate four openings at the primary level. On December 23rd, we conducted an all Montessori school professional development around ambitious instruction accelerated learning. We were fortunate enough to bring in presenters from Public Montessori in Action, which is a national Montessori organization to work with all Montessorians as a whole as well as breakouts by grade band. The presenters utilize Montessori language materials that are used in MPS classrooms and link the district's levers of formative practice, explicit instruction, and engagement for the outcome of student learning acceleration. Teachers created action plans to support their work as the year continues. Bringing all the Montessorians together for growth is one of our favorite events of the year. Public Montessori in Action also met with our school support teachers last week 
to support their coaching work to extend the outcomes of the presentation throughout the year. In November, I presented at the Wisconsin Montessori Association Conference regarding how to support Montessori instruction virtually. Attending and presenting at the conference fulfills the strategic plan and that we are continuing to bring awareness of MPS Montessori to the greater Montessori community. Mr. DiCarlo was a keynote speaker. This past weekend, we have held the kindergarten enrollment fair virtually. We had a booth for MPS Montessori where we were able to provide insight on Montessori education, talk about philosophy, and help families to know which Montessori, which schools are Montessori and where they are located. It was always great to see and interact with our families. Due to the ongoing pandemic, we are not holding the Montessori Summit this year. This event is typically held the weekend after the enrollment fair and showcases students working in classrooms. We look forward to bringing the summit back in 2023. Work that is happening in the month of February includes holding monthly Montessori principal meetings virtually. This has allowed for support of administrators as well as communication and collaboration among the MPS Montessori community. We will be working to allocate the $84,000 in Montessori scholarships. The scholarship application was originally presented in November and was reopened in January to allow for additional applicants. Two informational sessions were held on October 28th and January 20th regarding Montessori and MPS and the certification process. Two rounds of interviews were also conducted. The scholarship committee is meeting later this week to review the applicants. Notification of awards will occur February 18, 2022, and all the scholarships will be paid directly to the Montessori Certification Center that the candidate enrolls in. We are developing a relationship with students from the MPS School to Work Transition Program for Montessori material development. Many Montessori materials need to be made by hand. We've been working to create a library of Montessori materials that can then be ordered through our duplicating. This helps ensure equity that all classrooms have all the materials, even the handmade ones. This is especially important for those teachers who are currently in teacher certification training and who have not made these materials yet. Also, many materials that can be purchased have to be assembled, cut out, and sorted. Students in the School to Work Transition Program are engaged in some of those projects. The projects help with individual student learner objectives while helping schools in the district get the materials they need. Working with the De Department of Research Assessment and Data, we have been collaborating with the manufacturer of our grading system, Infinite Campus, to make the record keeping gradebook system work more efficiently for the Montessori teachers. Professional development has been provided at each of the school and we, schools, and we are looking to establish, establish a feedback committee to continue to refine this work. Working with the Department of Bilingual Multicultural Education and the staff at Riley Dual Language Montessori School, we are developing a dual language Montessori curriculum to use at the school. After much research, there is no dual language Montessori program that we have located that upholds the fidelity of both programs, Montessori and dual language, as we are setting out to create. We have been working to marry the two concepts in a way that honors the non-negotiables of each program while blending the concepts to form one cohesive program. Developing a whole new curriculum takes time and the effort of many. Chair Seamson, members of the committee, Joe DiCarlo, Principal Maryland Avenue Montessori School. Tonight, we also wanted to highlight our adult learners and Montessori certification programs. For administration, these courses are held at Seton Montessori in Chicago. We have two administrators who will be completing in May of 2023. For our secondary trainings, this program has been conducted by the Cincinnati Montessori Secondary Teacher Education Program, which is in partnership with MPS University. This certification program has 16 adult learners in it. When completed in September of 2022, the adult learners will earn a secondary Montessori credential for grades 7 through 12. Of the 16 MPS employees in training, 
15 of them are currently working in their permanent MPS Montessori school positions. For elementary, we're working with two providers for elementary certification. The 15 candidates from Alverno will be graduating in May of 2022. Of those, three are in their permanent MPS Montessori school positions. UW River Falls will be completing in December of 2022. Those three employees are in their current MPS Montessori school positions as well. For primary, the early childhood, we have five employees completing certification for or at Global Montessori Educators Institute. One is at UW River Falls. All five employees are currently in their permanent positions. Their completion date is December of 2022. With school expansions occurring at Lloyd Barbie Montessori, McDowell Montessori, and Bayview Montessori, openings are already anticipated for the fall. For the elementary teacher openings, we have candidates who will be available. We do not have any primary candidates currently completing certification who are not already teachers of record in the schools. We anticipate completing vigorous recruitment efforts to secure primary certified teachers for our openings. At this time, we're coming up to the midpoint of the Montessori strategic plan. During this time, we have had great successes with many items. One is having the Montessori coordinator position. This position really ensures that the strategic plan is accomplished and Montessori is supported across the district. We've updated all of our marketing as well. This includes a full refresh of our web pages, including text and images of students from each of our schools. We'll also be able to create videos that highlight Montessori in general, as well as each of the grade bands. These videos are on our webpage for potential families and are also used during events like the kindergarten enrollment. We created print media for families as well as Montessori teacher recruitment brochures and handouts. Also, a Montessori specific report card was created to better connect the work we do in the classroom with our reporting to families. The primary area report card rounds out the work that was already completed for lower and upper elementary. The report card rollout included training for staff, documentation for families, and parent education sessions, sessions to better understand the changes. The Montessori material standard of care, which you've already heard about earlier, will really help with the consistency and equity of all of our Montessori programs. Throughout this all, we've created structures of communication between the Montessori coordinator, the Office of Administration, and among the principals and parents. While reflecting on the great work we've accomplished, we also realize there's still much work to be done. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected our ability to complete some of the tasks in the strategic plan. There are items in the plan that would benefit from revisions and new timelines to be considered. Working with the Montessori Advisory Committee, we would like to complete a full review of the Montessori strategic plan and bring it back to the board at the May SASE committee meeting. The intention would be to present items that need to be revised, items that need to be removed, and adjusting timelines. To aid in the successful completion of our current Montessori strategic plan items and to ensure the continual and formal support of Montessori and MPS, this is also the time to begin discussion regarding the continua continuation of the Montessori strategic plan beyond 2024. This strategic plan was written pre-pandemic. As we navigate this new reality, we also need to reallocate funds to meet the district needs. When we wrote this plan multiple years ago, our goals and needs had a different focus. At this time, we're asking for the Montessori strategic plan budget to be adjusted as the current funding is in need of review. The pandemic has eliminated the possibility of hiring additional teachers, and we'd like to reallocate that specific budget line. Instead of letting that money go unspent, we need to look at best supporting the work we are completing now. We are requesting that current funds be reallocated, as well as seeking additional funds to support the completion of the Montessori strategic plan. Director Seamson, members of the board, Abigail Rausch, Montessori coordinator. The Montessori Advisory Committee has a Montessori strategic plan timeline for the 2021-22 school year. The Montessori Advisory Committee will continue to meet virtually on March 7th, April 4th, and May 2nd from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. The May meeting will be the last of the school year. More information, including the meeting link, can be found on our web pages mpsmke.com backslash Montessori. The American Montessori Society annual conference is being held on March 17th. We will attend the conference in person for teacher recruitment efforts. 
the Montessori classroom at MPS University will have a site accreditation visit from MACDI, the Montessori Accreditation Council for Teacher Education. The site visit includes interviews with our adult learners, as well as reviewing the facilities. This site accreditation is part of the process of having UW-River Falls and Alverno use our MPSU classroom as a site to hold teacher certification classes. We will work with the Montessori Advisory Committee to begin the revision process on the Montessori Strategic Plan with your permission. During the month of April, teacher recruitment will continue. This includes posting to national publications and websites and doing virtual meetings with adult learners at Montessori certification centers around the country. In addition to reaching out to potential candidates, support during the application process is also provided. We will continue to work on purchasing items using the literacy and science tech textbook adoption monies, as well as monies from the K-5 refresh. We are working with the Extended Learning Opportunities Office to determine the educational standards to be covered for this year's summer school. This summer, we will hold Montessori specific summer school at Lloyd Barbie Montessori School. Montessori summer school is for grades K-5 through grade six. Each year we have rotated the location of summer school to ensure that families have an opportunity to visit our various schools and to ensure that the opportunity to attend is not a barrier due to location. By May, Montessori orientation for district leaders will be complete. The Montessori strategic plan outlines that an orientation to Montessori curriculum, pedagogy, and philosophy should be offered to district administrators who supervise or work in Montessori schools. These include candidates enrolled in the district's emerging and aspiring leaders programs. There are five such internal training programs, including new principal, new assistant principal, aspiring leaders, emerging leaders, and dean of students. We will also begin communication with prospective families who have been waitlisted about available Montessori seats across the district. And finally, a committee will be formed to begin the process of defining the expectations for the implementation of the Montessori Middle School curriculum. At this time, we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, do committee members wish to make comments or ask questions? I see several. Um, Director Gokul Gandhi and then Director Carr. So Director Gokul Gandhi. Uh, thank you, Chair Simpson. I heard you mention that you um, need to reallocate funds uh, that haven't been spent or um, you need more funds. Is that correct? Did I hear that correctly? Administration. Go ahead. Uh, Director Gopal Gandhi, Joe DeCarlo, Principal Maryland Monastery. Yes, that is correct. Uh, at this time, we had some funds that were allocated originally two and a half years ago for um, hiring extra teachers to have on hold if in case we needed extra teachers. With the pandemic, we're not able to do that right now. So we don't want that money to go to waste. So we want to be able to reallocate that money to help complete some of the other items in the strategic plan that are currently active. Um, and the second part of your question was asking for additional money. Uh, there, there is an ask for additional money within this budget cycle. That's why we ask now so we can have it for this year, uh, which includes two main items. One is to help develop the curriculum for the dual language immersion program at Raleigh, because that's part of the plan, but there was no money initially allocated for that. And the second is for the secondary education, the seventh through 12th grade um, curriculum to be more formalized and implemented with across the schools. Director Gokul Gandhi, another just question? To, just to follow up. So yeah. um, Superintendent Posley, the money that is currently set aside for those, uh, the teacher recruitment, can, that can just be moved, right, without a board motion, because I would hate for them to have to wait a whole nother month um, if, if that requires action on our part. Administration? Chair Simpson and members of the uh, members of the committee. Yes, we can move those dollars. However, these dollars were voted up on by the board. And when we make adjustments, we always like to bring those dollars back to the board for approval. So the goal is that uh, we make those adjustments. And when we come back for our next quarterly report, we ask for approval during that time. 
it's one more follow-up question, Director Chair Simpson, and is and that would be an appropriate time, right? They, there would be no um, impact to them being able to fill that gap. Administration. Uh, Chair Simpson and members of the board, the answer would be no. We have a bottom line budget, so if we run over in one place, we can earmark them. We can move the money somewhere else. So, yes, we will be able to make happen what we need to make happen. Good. Are you all good, Director Gokul Gandhi? Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Director Carr. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Stevenson. Um, first and foremost, I, I want to say uh, thank you to the administration um, for your hard work, uh, for excellent presentation, a very thorough uh, assessment of the great work that's happening uh, in the Montessori programs and also um, great work to the community members who have invested a lot of time, energy, and efforts uh, to support these efforts as well. My question, uh, well, I have two questions. The first one uh, I'll start with is, how are the African-American students in the Montessori program achieving in comparison to their non-minority peers? Administration. Chair Simpson and members of the uh, committee. One of the things that we will have to, this is some information that we will have to get back to you, but uh, Abigail will uh, take, a, she will start it off, but the detailed information, we would have to work with research and assessment and get those uh, numbers back to you prior to the full board meeting. Abigail, anything that you have you want to share? Um, Director Carr, that's an excellent question. So um, when we look at the demographics of our students, each of our buildings um, has, a, has a different makeup. So in order to provide, you know, the specific information, um, I'd have to look and, you know, talk to the school leaders at each of those programs and get that information for you. Thank you. And Director Carr, you Thank have you. A, a second question? Yes, yes. And then a follow up. Um, and I'm not certain that I'm not sure if you all can answer this now, but I'm curious to um, see or um, curious to know how this initiative can um, possibly be expanded to sort of like the North Division community, um, a school that has a lot of promising um, opportunities. Um, uh, but uh, I'm just thinking like based on what's been presented and based on my knowledge, I would be curious to know like how this model um, could fit in uh, that specific uh, neighborhood or community. Uh, so if you are not able to answer today, I would love to, um, during our next meeting, our next SASE committee meeting, uh, have some answers or receive some answers uh, relative to how this could look um, and impact the North Division community. But uh, I'd be curious to know now. <laughs> administration. Director Carr, members of the committee, uh, Joe DiCarlo, Principal, Maryland Montessori. Um, I don't know if I can answer that specifically directly. I know we have Lloyd Barbie Montessori, which is in that neighborhood as well, just north of there. Uh, but one of the things that is in the strategic plan is looking at potential expansion of Montessori as appropriate and as you know we're able to. Right now, we have three programs that are still new and expanding. So that's been the focus, especially with the pandemic. Uh, we really had to re or focus our efforts to uh, you know, support those programs. So one of the things that we're looking at as we revise is to look at, you know, potential opportunities. And I think that would be in relation to your question um, as we look forward. So right now there isn't a specific plan there, but it's something that definitely is um, something to look into as we revise the plan. I know it's not a direct answer to the question, but I think that's <laughs> as, as much as we can get at this point to, um, to kind of look into, you know, possible other Montessori programs. Yeah, Director Carr, follow up. Yeah, um, yeah, I, and I figured there wouldn't be a, a, a concise, a clear, concise answer tonight. I would love uh, for that information to be brought back to the board during um, next month's SASE meeting, um, and I'll follow up with you all individually as well. But I, I think this would actually be a, a, a very unique um, opportunity to introduce this to the North Division. 53206 uh, community. And so I'd, I'd like to entertain any ideas. Um, yeah. And uh, Madam Secretary, in terms of bringing it back next month, I know the, um, is that something that we can put or is this waiting for the, do we have to wait for like the next Montessori update? Uh, Madam Chair, um, 
as chair of the committee, um, we could work with you uh, and the administration to determine the, the most appropriate time to bring that back. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mann. Mm -hmm. um, do any other committee members wish to ask questions or make comments? Um, if I could pass the gavel for just a minute to Director Garcia. So noted. Thank you. Um, yeah, so kind of along the lines of what Director Carr just said, you know, when we're looking, certainly this is a great time to revisit the plan. You know, we're halfway into it. Um, I just would really encourage when I when I hear redactions, that always makes me get a little nervous because, you know, the strategic plan just had, um, you know, some really great ideas in it. And, and it was, you know, paced out really well, obviously, the pandemic, but many other things can impact the best laid plans. So um, I would just really like to encourage us to, as we're extending that timeline, also look at, you know, make sure that we're looking at ways to expand this program, which is what I think I'm hearing you say as well. So that's sort of what I was looking for to make sure that we continue to expand this program. We have Craig Montessori on the Northwest side as well. That's, you know, so if there are some gaps in those uh, neighborhoods to make sure we are giving all of our families that opportunity, that would be great. Um, so just that comment, and then I'll take the gavel back, Director Garcia. So noted. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, do we have any public comment on this item? Yes, Madam Chair, we do have two individuals on the platform prepared to speak on this item. Great, let's go ahead to our public comment then. Okay, the first speaker on the platform to speak on the uh, item number five is Laura Graven. Please state your name, spell your last name and begin your testimony. My name is Laura Graven, G-R-A-V-E-N. Thank you. First team Chair Simpson and members of the committee. I'm Laura, I'm a parent and a founding member of the Montessori Advisory Committee. And I'm here tonight to simply thank you for your continued diligent work to bring this Montessori strategic plan to fruition. The work to create and pass this plan over two years ago was a heavy lift, but important work so that we can continue to improve, enhance and expand public Montessori within MPS. Successful public Montessori programs aren't as common as we often realize, and MPS is really, really fortunate to have a large program that we have and should be really proud of it. And it really requires continuous strategic planning in order to sustain it. The presentation tonight outlines really great work so far, but I really urge the committee to use this opportunity to pause and give specific direction to the administration and the committee. Um, I ask the board to do a few simple but really effective things, and that is to direct the administration and MAC to expand the specific work, as well as the timeline of this plan to a minimum of five additional years with um, continued quarterly reports to the board and also to direct and fund this plan to focus on very specifically and include a sustainable plan for teacher and administrator training for additional Montessori and bilingual teachers. It's no surprise that the most critical need for our Montessori schools is trained teachers and administrators. The teacher shortage has been a focus of the strategic plan from the start, and it needs to be prioritized now more than ever. Specialized teaching positions such as Montessori and bilingual schools require legitimate plans and funding in place for sustainability of all programs so that we can serve all students across the district well. There's certainly a number of other priorities within the strategic plan that need revisions, but teacher and administration training is the most critical in order to carry on strong Montessori programs within MPS. And so I ask for your continued support of these really thoughtful strategic planning efforts. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. The next speaker on the platform is Ingrid Walker Henry. Please state your name, spell your last name, and begin your testimony. My name is Ingrid Walker Henry, W A L K E R hyphen H E N R Y. Thank you. And I'm the parent of a student at Craig Montessori School and sit on the Montessori Advisory Committee. The Montessori Strategic Plan was started to strengthen and continue to solidify the public Montessori footprint in Milwaukee and the country, as MPS has the largest number of public Montessori schools. That is something to cheer, but there is a reality to acknowledge. Milwaukee is a highly segregated city. There are Montessori schools in each region of the city serving a diverse population of students and families. 
every student in every one of our Montessori schools deserves Montessori trained teachers. It should never be acceptable that any student's Montessori experience is disrupted because the district lacks a Montessori trained teacher. That experience shouldn't happen anywhere, but it definitely should not disproportionately impact schools that serve black and brown students. The work of the strategic plan must continue, but it has to continue with the prioritization of Montessori trained teacher recruitment and training opportunities. Teacher recruitment that happens across the country as well as at home. MPS has the responsibility to look for local people willing to take on the intensive Montessori training and develop a plan on how that training will happen in Milwaukee. This is critical as Alverno will no longer train Montessori teachers after this year. The solution is not sending people to Chicago or St. Louis or even further for this intensive training. That ensures that only people of certain economic standing are able to become Montessori teachers in MPS. Out-of-state training is not sustainable or feasible for many, nor will it provide the number of teachers needed over even the next five years. I ask the board to approve and continue the work of the strategic plan, but also to direct the administration to budget and prioritize a plan presenting solutions to address the need for a Milwaukee Montessori training site. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, that completes our public testimony on this item, and the item is back with the committee. Thank you so much. Um, is there any further discussion among committee members? Director Gol Kogandi? So just hearing the testimony that was given, um, I am curious to know if we can direct the administration to um, look into some of those things that were brought up during public testimony and to make sure that, that uh, those topics of concern are brought back to the SASE committee next month. Yes, um, administration. Chair Simpson and members of the committee, we uh, will sit down and take a look. What we really need to do is to take a look at the dollars that we already have earmarked to get those dollars moved into the places that they need to be and to work with the committee and in order to come back with uh, a proposal. Right now, we're just trying to clean up and making sure that we have the dollars where they need to be earmarked to, as well as finding the uh, teachers, uh, teacher candidates to go into the various programs. Also, uh, there was conversation around having a center here in Milwaukee. That's going to take a large number, that's gonna take a commitment of finding a large number of individuals that are willing to go through the program. And so that I just think that we need to uh, reconvene with the committee and, and, and uh, talk through this and then come back with a robust plan with some directions. Uh, direct follow up, Director Gokul Gandhi. Yeah, and and that's fine. I think even just a feasibility study of like of that of the analysis of that would be helpful. You know, I I totally hear you, but I think it would just be good for all of us to understand what is and isn't feasible in the next five to ten years. Uh, administration, Chair Simpson, and members of the committee, we one hundred percent agree. And uh, the team has been meeting and will continue to meet. And uh, we, you know, anytime you do a plan, you don't, we didn't plan for the pandemic. And so therefore it has slowed our growth. Uh, but also there are monies that are set aside that we need to just uh, redistribute and then see where we are at. Okay. Joe, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Chair Simpson, members of the committee, Joe DiCarlo, Principal Marilyn Montessori. Um, the questions that are being proposed or asked right now are really in relation to our original discussion and ask of the board is for us to be able to sit down, open up the strategic plan and make some revisions. Uh, you know, one of that being extending the timeline past the five years. Uh, but really, our goal is to have, you know, subcommittees and really meet with the, uh, the Montessori Advisory Committee, as well as the Montessori principals, obviously, and administration to make sure that we are addressing all these areas, how we can expand, how we can you know, continue to support Montessori, especially with the teacher training. We know that's a, a big, a big deal right now. So that is part of our purpose to come back at the May board meeting or uh, whatever pleases the board to give us some time to really look at that and have a, a appropriate a proposal. Um, 
Director Gokul Gandhi, I know we have also Director Carr had kind of brought up, you know, wanting some information possibly a little bit sooner. Director Gokul Gandhi, would you like a, you know, even if it's a mini update before the month of May? You know, I Is that I would defer to the team and the superintendent. I know that there are so many competing priorities. So if this is in alignment with opening up the strategic plan and having that conversation at a more appropriate time, I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure that we are addressing whatever needs the Montessori committee um, has. And if that if that's a more immediate need, then let's talk about that. But if it's not, then you know, you let us know. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I see Director Carr's hand as well. So Director Carr. Yes, um, I just wanted to, I wanted to ask for the administration um, and the committees to um, provide academic data um, before the regular board meeting. I think there's a lot of opportunities and my wheels are spinning, um, but I think in terms of a training facility or a training center, North Division could definitely uh, be that uh, if the proper uh, investments or resources were allocated to support that. In addition, again, I uh, say that North Division could also mirror the K through 12 McDowell uh, Montessori. Um, with the with that being a successful program, that could be replicated uh, or implemented at uh, North Division. And so, I'd like to see the academic data um, by the regular board meeting to. Um, further explore the possibilities here. Um, administration. Chair Simpson and members of the committee, uh, we will be more than happy to get you the star data that's available prior to the full board. So Dr. Mayo will go to working on that and get that out to you. But as far as the committee, uh, they are looking to stay with the May uh, timetable that they have in place. Uh, we were just uh, given a forecast tonight to let you know the work that we are doing and what we will be coming back to you with. So they are in a good place and May is 100% uh, acceptable for where they want to be. Thank you. Uh, Director Carr, any follow up to that? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand that. Um, if we can just get the data out, that would be fine. Um, but we can definitely... Uh, go back or entertain this in May or a follow-up, I'm sorry, in May. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director Garcia. Uh, yeah, so my uh, question is more of a clarification. Um, I know that we're, the number of staff or teachers that are getting, you know, the Montessori endorsement was mentioned, but just can you summarize, like, how many uh, adult learners are currently going through some of those programs that we offer, whether that's through MPSU or partnership programs? Administration. Um, Chair Seenson, Director Garcia, members of the board, Abigail Rausch, Montessori coordinator. Um, currently, um, we have 46 MPS employees enrolled in Montessori certification programs um, with eight organizations. Um, as we discussed in the presentation, um, many of those um, employees are already teachers of record. Um, we do have um, 12 elementary, we do have 12 staff members who are being elementary trained who are graduating in May who will um, be able to help fulfill our potential openings. Um, right now for fall, we anticipate having nine elementary openings. Um, and so we will have 12 staff members who are graduating. So we will have um, plenty of people um, to be able to fulfill those specific elementary openings. Thank you. Director Garcia, any follow-up to that? No, I think that this is great. And this is just one of those programs that I think makes um, you know, kind of working and retaining talent, you know, that we do offer that support and ways of, of making, um, I guess, like that, that more accessible to folks that are willing to, you know, stick with us. So thank you all. Thank you. Um, uh, Director Carr, I don't know if your hand is up for, nope. Okay, from before. So, <laughs> sounds good. Um, is there any further discussion? All right, well, this was an informational item. Um, so Madam Secretary, next item, please.
The next Hi. item, um, Madam Chair, we do have students who are here for the showcase item. And I'm wondering if um, you would like to go to that item to get those students presenting and home. <laughs> yes, I would 100% like to move that item to our next item, please. <laughs> okay, great. Um, one quick second. Then we will jump to our next item of business, which is a report with possible action on the regional showcase. This is an informational item, and although it has been noticed for possible action, no action is required. Will administration please present this item? Chair Simpson and members of the committee, this uh, month uh, we are featuring in the regional showcase, we're featuring Grappy High School. And we are welcoming tonight uh, Mr. Hall, who's the assistant principal in charge, who will be joining us with our presentation. And at this time, I'm going to be turning it over to the regional superintendent, Dr. Jennifer Smith, who will be bring, walking us through the presentation. And just for uh, the listening audience, we, we shifted a little bit and we have to get people from down the hall into the room. So it takes a little time to be able to do just that. But uh, we are excited about the work that's happening in the high school region. And uh, in our regional showcase is an opportunity for us to showcase the great work that is happening in our high school region. And tonight, like I said, is Grappy High School. And with no further ado, I will turn you over uh, to Dr. Jennifer Smith, who will walk us through. Good evening, Chair Simpson, members of the committee. I am Jennifer Smith, Regional Superintendent for the High School Region. Tonight, Mr. Turner, Mr. Ogunbowale, and I are proud to showcase the work of our region. The high school region consists of 26 high schools and the new Milwaukee Virtual Program. How's that Green Bay School? Our region is very diverse. All programs and specialties are offered to the high school students of MPS at at least one of our outstanding high schools. In addition to programmatic diversity, we are diverse in size. If students prefer a small family-like atmosphere, we have Alliance or North Division. But if students prefer a larger comprehensive school field, we have Hamilton or Riverside serving over 1,400 students each. You will see on the graphic to the right of the screen, that this year our region has served almost 23,000 students to date. Our schools support the varying needs of the students, including special education needs, language learners, and students living in circumstances of economic disadvantage. We utilize the tools provided by the district to support all students towards graduation and their post-secondary goals, whether that be career, military service, vocational training, or higher education. One of the ways that we are supporting students is by focusing on the alternatives to suspension and the district initiatives to support positive behaviors. Each month, our high schools have, through the OCR work, a staff team meeting to review behavior data and also two monthly meetings to engage our students in conversations about school climate. Here you will see our regional data related to suspensions overall. We are proud of the work being done this year to reduce suspensions, including central services suspensions. We are seeing increases in behavior referrals that result in actions such as peer jury or referrals to supportive services in our schools, including social workers, psychologists, and our IEP teams. Tonight, we shine the light on one of our high schools, James Grappy High School. Grappy High School sits prominently on 27th Street near Belief. Grappy High School serves as one of three alternative high schools focusing specifically on students in danger of dropping out or returning to school from dropout status. The alternative programs differ from traditional high school programs in that they are half-day programs awarding credit every nine weeks with computer-based and traditional face-to-face. -face. Students at Grappy are 17 years or older and motivated to complete high school within one year. Grappy serves many adult students with full-time jobs and families in need of a high school diploma to better their circumstance. Tonight's presentation from Grappy High School will demonstrate how the work of the five priorities 
is guiding Grappy towards the success for all students. This framework is not only the guide for the district, but is very much at the root of our schools, especially Grappy. I will now turn the presentation over to Grappy's leader, Mr. Savelle Hall, to elaborate on the work of the five priorities. Mr. Hall? Chair Seaman, Seamson, and members of the committee, I am Savelle Hall, administrator at Grappy High School. This fall, I started with the goal to have 30 students graduate by January 1st. I am proud to say that we met that goal and 30 students from Grappi crossed the stage for winter graduation on January 15th. This represents a record number of winter graduates for Grappi and the efforts of our staff to focus on graduation from the minute students enrolled. At enrollment, I meet with each student and their family member to determine the credits earned, credits or requirements needed, most appropriate program, and an anticipated graduation date. This goal, front and center from day one, lets our students know that graduation is within their reach. Once that date is established, all roads lead to graduation. We meet frequently to make sure students remain on track and offer evening and weekend supports when students get even a little off course. As I stated, at the time of enrollment, all students and a parent or family member are required to meet with me, the principal. At that meeting, in addition to the academic components, we set expectations for attendance and behavior. We have had 98% compliance with this expectation, which has resulted in only four incident referrals thus far this school year. Students understand the expectations at Grappi despite their at-risk status and behavior history. This is empowering to our students and encouraging to our parents. Once a part of our school, we work diligently to promote a positive and inclusive environment. As you drive by our building, you will see our Black Lives Matter mural, as well as the new school lettering, all created by students showing their pride in Grappi High School. None of the fantastic things I have mentioned would be possible without a talented and dedicated staff at Grappi. In the photo here, you will see our staff going above and beyond with parking lot instruction support sessions during virtual learning to check in while our buildings were closed. The Grappi staff make home visits, deliver materials as needed, identify district and community resources needed. Our staff have an all hands on deck and no excuses mentality when it comes to the success of our students. The teachers at Grappi are content specialists. With only one teacher per content area, teachers take pride in their work and their ability to find the approach needed for success with every student. There is no option to transfer to another class. They make it work with each student tapping into the resources available to them. Grappi has been fiscally responsible with our resources. We have not run a deficit once since I have been the leader. Not only are we not overspending, but we are getting better results each year with the allocation of resources. The chart shows that while our enrollment of seniors dipped slightly during 2021, the 2021 school year, we maintained the graduation rate. And this year, we have already surpassed the graduation rate with 30 students graduating in January. We are on track to have our highest graduation rate in four years. This is the work that we are most proud of. Finally, communication and collaboration. Being a part of the community is an important piece of our school. This year we have hosted our first ever LGBTQ Youth Summit, including a talent show with Safe and Sound, the City of Milwaukee Tobacco Free Alliance, and the Drug Free Coalition. We have partnered with many local businesses to support our students, including 
back to school haircuts, job fairs, interview preparations, and the donation of desks at the beginning of the virtual learning. Scott and Jeanne Schutz graciously, graciously donated the desks, which our students were happy to personalize for a productive workspace at home. One of my biggest collaborations is with my fellow leaders in the high school region. We work together to problem solve for individual students that may not be successful in traditional school settings. This has resulted in many students graduating that were considering dropping out of school. As we look to the future of Grappi, our goals are to maintain our growth in the graduation rates. To do this, we will look to increase the academic and social supports students receive on their path to graduation. We will also continue to provide students with resources and connections to opportunities post high school, including higher education, vocational training, and job opportunities. I would like to introduce Grappi students, Deshaun Hawkins, Twanye Jones, and Vashti Smith, who will share about their experiences and successes at Grappi. Good morning. I mean, good evening, Charity Simpson and members of the community. My name is Deshaun Hawkins. I'm 18 years old and I go to James Goppy High School. I started going to Goppy in 2019. I switched schools because I was behind in school credits. I wanted to go to a smaller school too. Even though I was behind, I'm proud to say that I am graduating this year. I am the second oldest out of my three out of three boys, and I will be my mom's first son to graduate from high school. I'm proud of myself because I work hard to reach my goal. I became a better student and a better man because of the help from my teachers. My teachers helped me to stay focused and not give up at Guapi. I was connected to people who could help me reach my goal. Thank you, Mr. Hall, and all the teachers you have at Guapi. Good evening, um, Chair Simpson and the members of the committee. My name is Clay Jones. I am a senior at uh, James Grappy High School. I knew traditional school wasn't working for me. I was falling behind during freshman year. I fell further behind during virtual school during the pandemic crisis. I was really happy when I found out about Grappy from my cousin who attended James Grappy. He really liked it. It meant a lot to me that Ms. Hall said to me after our interview, he gave me a reality check about what Grappy could offer me. I began attending James Grappy High School September 8, 2021. I knew I would have to work hard to catch up where I needed to be with credits. Mr. Hall explained different programs like computation, GBO2, and the traditional pathways to earning my high school diploma. He told me about the uh, different scheduling options I could choose based on what worked for me. Honestly, I think it's really cool that there are different options for students that are behind in credit or students that need a non-traditional option to finish high school. James, James Rocky is a great school option. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Simpson and the members of the committee. My name is Vashti Smith. I'm a senior at James Grappy High School. My high school journey has not been the easiest due to the pandemic. Virtual learning really took a toll on my mental health. I began to feel isolated and alone. I found myself feeling unmotivated and losing focus of my goals. Just when I wanted to give up, I was very fortunate to receive an opportunity to attend Grappi. I was very nervous at first due to not knowing what to expect or if I could finally get back on track. When I first arrived, I was welcomed with open arms when teachers who were ready to help me and saw the potential in me. Meeting with Mr. Hall and Ms. Green, we discussed my future and my action plan to not only help me graduate, but to also plan what I wanted to do after high school. Knowing that everyone's journey and path is not the same, at Grappi you are treated as an individual. The school offers smaller class sizes and program options that fit your needs to help you be successful. Many of the teachers and staff have really helped me on my journey to graduating, even when my mental health and motivation began to lack. They were always there for me, checking in with me, encouraging me, and even calling me if I wasn't in school. Every teacher at Grappi is so genuine and supportive. They truly want the best for you and want you to reach your full potential. At Grappi, I always feel safe and comfortable knowing the staff is always available to support me throughout my journey. 
I've learned many things at Grappy, but one thing I will never forget is that it is never too late to make changes and get back on the right path. Since transferring to Grappy, I've been on the honor roll every semester, and I've applied to colleges and gotten multiple resources to help me succeed even after high school. I would like to leave you all with my favorite quote that has really inspired me this year and perfectly describes my journey at James Grappy High School. Nothing is impossible. The word itself says I'm possible. Thank you. Well, thank you. And can we give it up for our young people? You are truly amazing. And it's the reason we do the work that we do on a daily basis because of each of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we are now open for any questions that you may have as a board. Thank you, thank you so much. And I echo what the superintendent just said. So first, if we have any uh, questions or comments for the students, we'll take those first. After that, we'll go around to any questions or comments you may have related to the um, to the high school report that was given. So first, our students, Director Leonard. Uh, thank you. As a former teacher for 28 years, listening to you and what you're saying is a joy to my heart. Um, I had the opportunity of, to be at the uh, winter graduation, and, and some of my students graduated from Grappi. They gave me a big hug, and I was missing them terrible, and I'm just very proud of you, and uh, keep up the great work. You will do just fine. Thank you. Yes, they will do just fine. Um, so the hands I saw were, I'm just gonna go kind of in the order I happened to catch them. Director Garcia, Director Carr, Director Gokul Gandhi. So we'll start with Director Garcia. Yeah, so just in a, a line of congratulations, I know that there's a lot of hard work from the adults that are involved in ensuring that, you know, the youth within our city feel seen appreciated, validated. Uh, we have three testimonies here of students that, you know, because of the pandemic and, you know, the issues that, you know, youth are facing right now, it makes learning hard sometimes. And it makes you wonder whether or not, you know, you can achieve goals. And I think that programs like um, the ones we offer at James Grappy, because of the dedicated staff, because of the dedicated parents, uh, we see that things that dreams are possible that goals can be achieved so congratulations to the three students especially to the young man that's graduating that is leading within his family as a first you know high school graduate that's a humongous achievement that you should be very proud of and you know just kudos to everyone involved you know from uh the regional uh superintendent uh, mrs smith to you know mr hall the principal and all of the adults and you know your peers that continue to motivate yourself um you all so thank you for sharing those stories with us because it's those testimonies that i think really contextualize you know why we are here um uh, you know ensuring that things magically happen you know during times that mean a lot to students so thank you Thank you. Uh, Director Carr. Uh, I seem to have lost Director Carr. Don't see her at the moment. So we'll go to Director Gokul Gandhi. Uh, thanks, Chair Simpson. I also just want to say congratulations to the three of you. It has been such a hard year, and I heard all of you say the pandemic was just, you know, barrier upon barrier of so many things. And so um, just congratulations on all your hard work. And I want to also say thank you to all the adults that are involved in making sure that we create inclusive, supportive environments. And um, you guys really do make us all MPS proud. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Yes, just echoing my colleagues as well. You know, thank you students for sharing your stories. It's very powerful and um, you should be very proud of your accomplishments. And, um, you know, we like Director Leonard said, we know you are going to be just fine and do well. So thank you for sticking with us tonight. I know it got a little bit late, um, but I don't see Director Carr on my screen. So uh, we'll let the students go at this time. And now we'll go back to if there are any questions regarding you know, specifics to the high school region in that showcase. If there are any uh, comments or questions regarding that. Um, um, Director yeah. Carr wanted to speak, but her entire computer uh, here at Central Office shut down and oh, no. technology is assisting her with getting oh. it um, back online. But wanted okay. to congratulate uh, the students at Grappy and thank them for coming to speak tonight. 
Yes, well, that, that darn technology. <laughs> um, so back to committee members. Um, I didn't see any hands for questions regarding the regional showcase presentation. Um, do we have any public comment on this item? Madam Chair, we have no request for public testimony on this item. All right, well, um, I don't see any further discussion. You know, I don't see any hands raised. So thank you so much for that report. Um, and now we are going back to, I believe, item number six. That Madam is Secretary. correct. All right, here we go. <laughs> item number six is a report with possible action regarding the ambitious instruction. This is an informational item, and although it has been noticed for possible action, no action is required. Will the administration please present this item? Chair Simpson and members of the committee, we would like to present you with an update on the Ambitious Instruction Accelerated Learning Plan. We have Dr. Melanie Stewart and Dr. Uh, Saffo uh, is here this evening, and they will be presenting information, and after which we'll be more than happy to entertain any questions that you may have. Dr. Saffo. Thank you, Dr. Posley. Good evening, Chair Simpson and members of the committee. Felicia Saffold, Senior Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Today, Dr. Melanie Stewart and I are here to share some exciting things that are happening in academics. Through our Ambitious Instruction Accelerating Learning Initiative, we are having an impact on teaching and learning. All of our work is driven by the five priorities of success. And in this presentation, increasing academic achievement and accountability is our focus. Ambitious instruction accelerating learning promotes consistent opportunities for students to work on grade level work. Strong instruction where students do most of the thinking in a lesson. Deep engagement in the learning and teachers who believe students can meet grade level standards. Our professional learning plan has three cycles that follow a gradual release model. In cycles one and two, we have spent a lot of time teaching teachers how to set learning targets, <clears throat> use district adopted resources, and provide scaffolding support. We will end the year with teachers empowering students and serving as facilitators of learning. I'm really excited to see this shift in teaching and learning from March through May. This is the kind of transformation that we know will set our students up for ultimate success. So the question from the committee last time I spoke about ambitious instruction accelerating learning was, how do we know this work is having an impact? I'll now turn it over to Dr. Melanie Stewart to share some data from our walkthrough rubric. Dr. Stewart. Good evening, Chair Seamson, members of the committee. I'm Melanie Stewart, Director of Research Assessment and Data. Tonight, we are looking at the end of cycle one. This was a 12-week period of learning and implementation and coaching. This is looking at the walkthrough data. The idea is that as adults are learning, we do checks for understanding to make certain they have learned what we have been teaching. But then we follow this to look at the implementation of this learning in the classroom where they can be supported, have coaching, et cetera. The walkthrough data shows the data that is collected in the thousands of visits and walks throughout the district in what they are seeing. Here you can see in Lever 1 formative practices, the success indicator for learning intentions and success criteria. By the end of cycle one, 62.5% of observations saw good use of learning intentions and success criteria. Likewise, checking for understanding, making certain that students are learning what is being taught, that was observed 66.7% of the time during the walks. If we go to the next lever, explicit instruction, because we've had, as you know, a large adoption of many instruction, new instructional materials, 
plus other high quality instructional materials used in the district, we made certain that as we did walks, those materials were being used. You can see in the first one, the use of instructional materials, by the end of the cycle, the walkers were seeing 70%, 70.8% of teachers using those instructional materials. Likewise, we saw a shift through cycle one as more and more teachers began using grade level instructional strategies and content. The last lever is looking at academic practices that promote emotional, cognitive, and behavioral engagement. As you can see here, by the end of the cycle, the rich learning experiences through technology, 47.4% of teachers were observed using technology in the classrooms. Looking at cultural context in lessons, we saw increase over the cycle. To that, we had 69.6% .6 of classroom observations seeing cultural context being used in lessons. Finally, Looking at culturally responsive strategies, we saw 65.2%. This also included our work from Summer, from Goldie Mohammed, Susie Pepper Rollins. We've had presentations by our Black and Latino Male Achievement Group, uh, Courageous Conversations, and others in the district in these areas. I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Sappold so she can show you a little bit of ins ambitious instruction in action. Thank you. Now you will get a chance to get a glimpse of the kinds of classrooms and the results we are seeing across the district in all grade levels. We are sure that by having a focus on hands-on, minds-on strategies and getting teachers to understand and implement culturally responsive teaching practices, soon our Standardized assessments will also show that ambitious instruction, accelerating learning is having an impact.
as you have seen all of the tremendous work and our wonderful students, we wanted to bring forward some of our baseline data. This year, our STAR, which is our universal screener, at the beginning of the school year, we want to kind of set the context because as students first came in, some were more ready to assess than others. So early literacy, which is our grade one students, we had about 69% of our students taking the assessment. Reading, which is grades two and above, we had about 74.5%. And our math, which is grade one and up, we had about 73% of students testing. To just have a little bit of grounding in what we always talk in our colors and we always have our little charts, but what does this mean? If you are looking at any color of green in reading, that's the 60th percentile and up. That corresponds to predicting proficiency or above on the state test. The below target, the blue area in reading is the 26th to the 59th percentile. That is in, compared to the basic on our state assessments. Those students performing in the red and yellow, that's the first to the 25th percentile, and that correlates to below basic. We use this so we can see how our children are doing along the way and have a better understanding of where they may be testing and performing on state tests. Math is slightly different that our below target, our below basic goes from the first to the 39th percentile. Our basic area or the blue area is the 40th to the 74th and proficient and above is at the 75th percentile. This was done through linking studies between STAR and our state results. At the beginning of the school year, we are looking that at early literacy, we had about 10.9% of our students that were on target or above. In reading, about the same amount. We had about 11.1%. And in math, about 6.8% were on target. We have just finished our testing window, and I'm excited that we are seeing some gap closing growth, but we will be sharing those details with you next month at SASE. And so at this time, I want to thank you for your attention and we'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you very much. Do committee members wish to make comments or ask any questions? I don't see any hands at this time. Uh, Madam Secretary, do we have any public comment on this item? Madam Chair, we have no request to speak on this item. All right, back to committee. Any further questions? No, well, I would just like to say, with looking at the video just gave me chills. I love seeing kids work. And um, if I could count how many times I saw joy in the description, um, that was really wonderful to see. You know, that's what we should be all about every day, as I know you guys are, that idea of joyful learning. So thank you for that report. And Madam Secretary, what is our next item? The next item is item number seven, a report with possible action regarding the bilingual education and the District Multicultural Multilingual Advisory Council, DMAC. This is an informational item, and although it has been noticed for possible action, no action is required. Will administration please present this item? Chair Simpson and members of the committee, we are pleased to share our quarterly report of the 2021-22 school year on bilingual education and the District Multicultural Multilingual Advisory Council. This evening, I would like to thank the uh, team of Eduardo Gavon, Lorena Ganey, and Dr. Tatiana Joseph for leading these efforts. At this time, I will turn it over to Mr. Gavon to lead us through the presentation. Mr. Gavon. Thank you, Dr. Posley. Good evening, Chair Simpson, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Eduardo Galvan, Regional Superintendent of the Southwest Region. As Dr. Posley mentioned, we'll be giving our quarterly report and update for BME, Bilingual Multicultural Education, and DMAC. And so we will begin. Again, all the work that we do centers around the district's five priorities for success in the work of BME and the DMAC committee. Uh, touches on all of those points, which will lead to success for our students. 
This slide is just an updated uh, since our last uh, presentation uh, with some of the demographic data. So we served 15,300 students in our bilingual schools, our 21 schools, uh, since the beginning of the year. Again, there you see 64% uh, of the students in the bilingual schools, the 21 schools are Hispanic. Again, of those approximately, <coughs> excuse me, of those 15,000, 26 of those are in a bilingual program. In addition, we have students in 21 schools who receive ESL. And again, just to clarify, um, all of those ESL students and our bilingual students in, in our ESL population represents many, many languages. Over 90 languages are represented in, in those languages. Again, the mission is to provide um, equitable access to quality multilingual and multicultural programming in MPS schools. And MPS students graduate with a strong cultural and linguistic identities, leveraging these assets to navigate college, career, and life as global citizens in an inclusive society. So what we'll be presenting is uh, some of the fundamentals from the resolution, um, bilingual expansion and programming, program parent engagement and marketing, district multicultural multilingual advisory council, which we'll refer to as DMAC, uh, the seal of biliteracy and professional development to schools. And Ms. Guinea will present a lot of those updates in the upcoming slides. Next slide. Good evening. Chair Simpson and members of the committee, my name is Lorena Yeni, Director of the Department of Bilingual Multicultural Education. I will continue the presentation with updates in bilingual, English as a second language, and world languages. The Department of Bilingual Multicultural Education is excited to continuously share updates on the biliteracy year at a glance, which is a strategically map out literacy, science, and social study units in Spanish and English grades K-5-8, in accordance with the MPS Content and Language Allocation Plan. The Content and Language Allocation Plan delineates the language that each content area is primarily taught in for every grade K-12. Explicitly, explicit instruction and formative practices based on grade level standards using Arriba La Lectura and Galeria de Lengua y Cultura Adaptive Resources are detailed in the corresponding integrated biliteracy units, which continue to be written, revised throughout the school year. Bilingual teachers have regular opportunities to explore these resources during professional development sessions as well as in one-on-one -on -one planning sessions. Bilingual teachers have given input and feedback on this document throughout the development process. We will continue to develop a literacy unit for these resources and offer the corresponding professional development needed as well. 16 participants attended our first Saturday supported by literacy planning sessions. New bilingual teachers have attended several professional development sessions as well as one-on-one -on -one or small group support sessions. To date, 59 connections with new bilingual teachers have been made. The Department of Bilingual Multicultural Education and the area of English as a second language is proud to announce the award of the Refugee Impact and Refugee Youth Mentoring Grant. Services are being planned for implementation in the spring and summer to support new arrivals with academics and social and or civic engagement. A story school began an intense focus on English language development as the strategy to impact tier one instruction and increase coherence throughout the school building. Cago recently joined on as the bilingual dual language pilot school and professional development will begin soon. In addition, school leaders attended drop-in sessions that the, at the January Leadership Institute to receive an update about the English language development in all programs that educate English learners. Updates include professional development and support opportunity, as well as home language service training for the identification of English learners in Title III. We will continue to support the implementation of the English Language Development Action Plan throughout the month to come. 
Opportunities to monitor progress will be through professional development to all schools, and specifically through the pilot schools. In years one to three of the pilot approach, progress will be monitored using a professional development checklist. Participants and the presenters will be able to see the progress that participants are making in the professional growth as the checklist serves as a tool for communication and monitoring. Then, beginning in year two, the district uh, workout walkthrough tool will include elements around English language development, ELD, that both the school and district teams can use to monitor ELD and ambitious instruction. Teacher support sessions included a range of topics to support the individual needs of teachers, whether they are new or veteran teachers. For example, new teachers receive an orientation that acclimates them into their first year. Important points include the standards, joining the, ESL, the ESL listserv, lesson planning, English learning identification process, and access testing. Veteran teachers discuss products and resources and ways to further engage with the community to support instruction. Our world language and emergent team continuously support our teachers with the, the utilization of the world language curriculum map and lesson plan template to provide clear consistency and level the language instruction across the district. Currently, we are working in the implementation and use of Mango language throughout the district. There will be a PD to world language teachers on February 15. This PD will focus on how to use Mango languages for lesson planning within the world language curriculum map. Our CLO by Literacy Year has begun with over 150 students attempting to graduate with the seal in nine different high schools. These high schools are Riverside, Bradley Tech, Hamilton, Milwaukee School of Languages, Golda Meir, Pulaski, Milwaukee High School of the Arts, and South Division. Professional development has been held with school-based coordinators, throughout the year to make sure everyone follows the timeline and all students have the same opportunity to work for and, to work for and attain the CEO. In addition, our team has identified 22 low incident partner languages spoken by our MPS students to add to the CEO by literacy criteria to list. At this time, we are waiting for DPI approval in order to move forward. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Joseph to give the DMAC update. Dr. Joseph. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll make it short tonight uh, in the interest of time. Um, a couple of updates. We've spent uh, the last about two months really rethinking a strategy uh, for recruitment of families. Uh, we want to make sure that all of the families in the district have an opportunity to learn and participate in DMAC. And as such, I've uh, been working with uh, the advertisement and media departments in central office to make sure that um, the, messaging, the messaging is going out to all of the schools and parent coordinators and the families. Uh, we also hosted, um, I believe it's probably one of the first parent meetings of the Mango Language app last month which was very success, successful and um, had a lot of interest from families um, around the idea of taking this family approach to learning a language or strengthening one's language, or in the case of families who may not speak a language where the child is in an immersion program, they can learn the language along with the child. So we're hoping to use um, that same energy to bring Mango to um, different communities throughout uh, the MPS fa uh, community. Uh, we're currently working on, still working on the World Language Recommendation Plan that was um, uh, sent out to uh, Central Office Administration a couple of months ago. Um, there, we hope to have more of an update on that at the next update. Um, I just want to invite all the families who are listening. Our next DMAC meeting is March 16th. So next week, Wednesday, um, and we will post that information on the district um, um, Facebook and other modes of communication uh, to provide information of how to log in to that meeting. 
Thank you. At this time, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, do committee members wish to make uh, comments or ask any questions at this time? I see Director Leonard. So uh, first comment is on Mango. I had the chance to uh, be at the DMMAC meeting last month when they presented it. Very good presentation. Uh, very exciting to see a conversational uh, language teaching tool that was so easy to access. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I hope that we can promote it enough to get a lot of people on it. I think it has a it has a great potential. Um, just a couple of questions, uh, or maybe just one question. How many teachers are we short with regards to dual languages or bilingual bilingual teachers? Administration. Yes, uh, Director Leonard, uh, Chair Seamson, members of the committee. Uh, give me one second. I had that here. Uh, in our particular bilingual schools, we have 21 teacher vacancies of bilingual teachers and 10 paras. Uh, Follow-up, Director Leonard? Yeah. Um, it, 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 does that include the, the people, the paras that are going into the MPSU program? Are we looking at them as a possibility of some of those filling those positions down the road? Administration. Well, Excuse me, Director Steamson, Director Leonard, members of the committee, Eduardo Galvan. Uh, so this number of vacancies is represented by represents those that are not currently filled. So we do have currently paras that are in program, whether that's through one of our partner programs uh, that are through MPSU and working towards a degree. Um, so subsequently, we also have those 10 pair shortages because many of our pairs, as we've discussed in previous meetings, have moved yeah. up into those positions. Positions, okay. Um, any curiosity as to how, how is recruitment going? I mean, I've, I've been with DMMAC for a long time, as you know, so I just, I'm looking to see if we can be of any assistance in any way at all possible to help you recruit more teachers. I guess that's the best way to put that. Administration. Well, the district, excuse me, uh, Chair Seamson, Director Leonard, members of the committee. Um, I know the Human Resources Department continues to work tirelessly. We have recruitment fairs going on. I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, we have one on the 26th, um, as well as a number of different areas. I know Human resources, whenever we're able to have, um, for example, during our, our enrollment fair, they had a booth. Uh, they were constantly looking for ways to recruit um, teachers of all kinds, right? I know as part of the work that we've done with the bilingual task force, we've also uh, done work at the high school level and had conversations. Um, it's been a little bit more difficult because of the pandemic, but for example, trying to expose students at the high school level uh, to what being a teacher means and specifically in a bilingual uh, school, right? So for example, uh, Mr. Trejo, the, the principal over at South Division, we've had conversations about when a student is expressing some sort of desire or even an inkling that they might want to be a teacher to have them maybe spend some time uh, at Forest Home school or um, Allen Field School, which are, are so close, right? And work with a highly trained, qualified bilingual teacher so that they can get that experience and develop that love of working with, with students and specifically with our bilingual students and use that gift of language that, that they have already with them. Thank you. Thank you. And no, no I know you're working at it. I just, I, it's good to hear different ideas of what you're doing. Um, I would love to see us become a literal bilingual district where everybody has at least a second language, if not more, before they graduate from our schools. That would be an unbelievable boon to their uh, professional lives down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Director Garcia. Uh, thank you all for the um, report on sharing out. I think there's like really good information that, you know, is being shared, especially for a listening audience is the fact that, you know, when we think of bilingual education, there is a breadth of programs that are offered, um, you know, that impact 
different ways of uh, either acquiring a different language or maybe learning, you know, English, uh, whether that's your second, third, fourth language. Um, is I know that we um, in the report it was mentioned the us getting a re the refugee school impact grant. Um, so I just wanted to have a quick clarification as to what the I guess like the impact that we're looking at is like how many uh, ad additional like students are we able to serve with that or what does that look like from a implementation side of things? Administration. Chairs Simpson, Director Garcia, and members of the committee. The refugee impact grant basically, you know, they do have certain guidelines that we have to adhere to. And one of one of them is that uh, they have to be a refugee, you know, uh, for the first year, you know, or not not more than three years for sure. So that's one of them. The other one is that we do have to make sure that the students do get the civic aspect of it within the grant and education and tutoring to advance the language, uh, the English language acquisition. That's huge. And uh, really also, also uh, give us the opportunity to be able to do the tutor and also uh, to buy some technology if the family needs it. So they do have it spell out, you know, every everything that we can do within the grant. Um, meeting with the families, taking the, the students to specific field trips so they have the opportunity to apply the language and so on. So the refugees that we have for the, uh, for the again, we have to look at the list and we have to uh, see who will be the cooperating schools because we do need teachers to cooperate with us and uh, to collaborate with us. And of course, uh, they're also, uh, you know, paid through the grant. But we do have to uh, uh, talk to the to the principals and the teachers and also look for that information on, on the children. Uh, you know, the refugee, make sure that we have the I-94 because we do have to report all of that to the state. Follow up, Dr. Garcia. No, thank you. And then just one more uh, item. I know that it was mentioned a couple ways that folks can get involved. And, you know, the bilingual task work is, is one of them. Um, DMAC is obviously one of them. So just for a listening audience, can we just clarify, like, who the, I guess, the um, targeted audience for each of these committees are? And then just ways of how who are folks who want to get involved, how they can find that information. Um, Dr. Joseph, would you like to speak to DMAC? Yes, thank you. So DMAC is a, um, I describe it as a bi-parent, four-parent committee um, made up of uh, many different uh, community members, board members, teachers, um, parent coordinators, uh, and, and all uh, with one idea in mind to support, strengthen, and grow um, multilingual opportunities for students in the district. So we are always um, try to be as hands-on as possible from a parent's perspective in ways to support and, and uh, really tell the narrative of the MPS portfolio as it relates to our experiences as parents. Um, our information you can find by contacting your parent coordinator, um, by checking out the Thursday updates, um, checking out the Facebook page. We have a Facebook page for DMAC and we have a Facebook page. Um, we used or we post the information on the MPS Facebook page. Um, if you still can't find it, um, it, you can email me. My email is josepht at uwm.edu and I can share that information um, with whomever is interested. Um, but we really would love to see representation from community and um, just all of the schools, every school should have a voice and an opportunity to be part of this instrumental change that our, our, our city needs. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. And administration, other ways to be involved? Uh, Chair Simpson, members of the committee, Eduardo Galvan, again, as Dr. Joseph mentioned, you can certainly uh, find the DMAC information in a variety of different places. Uh, you can email uh, Dr. Joseph, as she had mentioned, or you can reach out to me as well, um, Galvan E.M. at milwaukee.k12.wi.us. Uh, in terms of the task force, the task force um, did present an initial uh, 
the recommendation or draft to the board, which was approved, and there were four points that uh, was asked for more clarification. We are in the process of finalizing those, and we will present those to the board in the near future. Uh, but again, any questions that you may have uh, in regards to bilingual education, you can certainly reach out to Ms. Guinea and her team. They're here to support as well, myself, um, Dr. Joseph, and we'll be happy to find the information or point you in the right direction. Thank you. Director Garcia, any follow-up to that? No, just thank you all for the incredible work in, you know, getting things done and presented and connected to our community. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, do we have any public comment on this item? Madam Chair, we have no request for public testimony on this item. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All right. Um, well, thank you, um, Dr. Joseph, for visiting us tonight. And thank you so much, the rest of the team, for the report. Always appreciate those updates. And Madam Secretary, next item, please. Madam Chair, given that you've already dispensed with the showcase item, which was item number eight, that was the last item on tonight's agenda for this meeting. For this meeting, correct. Mm -hmm. um, now, there is no further business before this committee. So we're going to adjourn this meeting. And I know we have another one after that. So uh, Dr. Mann, are there any specific directions that you would like to give the directors or listening members of the audience? Uh, yes, for our listening audience, uh, the board members will log out of uh, this current uh, platform and log back in. Um, anybody who is registered to speak for the next meeting, please remain on the platform. Uh, if you try to log in while we're, we're still in this meeting, you may get an error message not allowing you to log in or indicating that you are not allowed to speak. But the minute that we open up the second meeting, you will have access to the platform. Thank you so much, Dr. Mann. Mm -hmm. So as I said, there is no further business before this committee. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. This meeting is adjourned. Good night. Thank you.